Yeah, I'm watching. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, but I know you away, so I can't take that. So, no, no, I told you that you must, don't think of me as just being away. It's our work is actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you tell me about me. It's not like I'm, yeah. Okay. 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 No problem. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Maybe I'll see for the date the moon come. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Today they message Kazo for the, the excess bond, so they got a lawyer. They contact her and they set that up. So that part is done. By Monday, remember you told me ask her. So I told her give me the dates now. By Monday, Tuesday, I'll know about my one. Yeah. Mine is for the property. Hers was for excess. So excess. Oh, I see. Yeah. So then. Yeah, yeah, you have that time. Yeah, yeah. Because so, it's stressful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, no, no, let's say the thing is because this um, is not indicated there, okay. it's because um, you haven't reached okay. the August date. So I didn't know if I didn't know you were on the stage. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. We're just waiting for about two minutes to let everybody to join before we start our meeting today. Thank you, Hayley. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Mended Hearts and Strokes meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody and also welcome our keynote speaker, Prof Malan. My name is Heidi Simring, and I'm the Nutrition Science Team Leader at the Foundation, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm just gonna switch my camera off because the internet's unstable, but I just wanted to say hi to everybody. Thank you, Hayley. Our program for today is we're going to start off with an introduction of the speaker. And then we have our presentation by Prof Milan. And we'll allow for 10 minutes for Q's and A's after her presentation. Just as a note, we've got consent to record this 
presentation, but no photos can be taken of the slides without the speaker's permission. So in celebration of World Hypertension Day, we are hosting this webinar today and our keynote speaker, who is one of our grant holders, is Prof. Leonie Milan, and she'll be discussing mental health and hypertension, as I said, in celebration of World Hypertension Day, which was on the 17th of May. I'd like to introduce, again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Prof. Milan. Um, Prof. Milan was awarded a grant with us in April 2019 and is due to finish in August 2021. Her study is on acute and chronic stress, susceptibility for brain and cardiac injury. A brief background of Prof. Milan is she commenced with research in 2006 and aim to describe a mechanistic pathway pertaining stress and the brain-heart axis. Hence, she designed the first brain-heart prospective cohort study in sub-Saharan Africa in 2008. As the principal investigator of the sympathetic activity and ambulatory blood pressure in African study, she received an international award for project design excellence. She also conceptualized implementation of a hypertension research and training clinic at Northwest University with cardiovascular monitoring programs in, in collaboration with clinicians and gave several community talks. She is a working group member of various brain, heart and vascular biology societies She's published over 165 articles and delivered 40 masters and PhD students. Lastly, she and her husband, Nico Milan, validated a chronic emotional stress and stroke risk phenotype as mobile screening instrument for preventative health care. So it gives me much pleasure again to hand you over to Prof. Milan for her presentation today. Unmute. Can everyone hear me? So um, I will go to the, I have to go to the beginning of the presentation. Um, Prof, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but there is no sound um, we can see your slides clearly, but there's no sound. Okay, I will, I will just start it again. Prof, um, Prof, Prof, I think that you might be on mute. If you can just unmute quickly. Can you hear me? 
and then you can share your screen. Okay, I'm sharing. What is it saying on your side? I don't get to the sharing part where it starts from the beginning. Now I'm at the front page, but um, I don't see the sharing part of it. Um, After you maybe just want to log off quickly and then just log back on. I think so. Okay. Sorry for that. No problem. So you can just open your, your slideshow at the bottom. Yeah. Um. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a computer edit. Th uh, sorry for that. So can I go ahead? Yes, you may go, bro. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And sorry for this glitch. I'm very glad that you can be here, all of you. And I really hope that um, this talk will prove to be um, uh, a real investment of your time because you took the time to get here and be and attend this, this uh, presentation. So we will have a few points that we will discuss. And uh, uh, the, first I will give a small general uh, background of um, uh, where we came from. And uh, also then uh, the problem that we had since we started in 1988. I was not there actually. I only entered the, 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 the field much later. But um, this is where the stress research started from 1988. That was over three decades. And then um, the lastly, um, a potential solution is that in 219 to 221, we actually, from we got the sponsoring from the Heart and Stroke Foundation, we uh, really digged into the problem and um, a lot of research has been done since then. Um, do you, you know, we have mentioned, Haley has mentioned that it was World Hypertension Day. So the figures that I got from 2019 was that the, globally, the prevalence of hypertension was 22%, which is really uh, underrated, I think, because it's not the true thing. And that is the blood pressure for 140 over 90. So um, what we found in uh, several studies in Mapumalanga and in Northwest that it was closer to 67%. So it, you can see there's quite a discrepancy in, in the blood pressure measurements. What is concerning is that hypertension prevalence and the lack of blood pressure control is still escalating. It's concerning us. So, uh, and the, the, the causative factors that they, they put through to everyone is that um, the males are more prone to get high blood pressure, salt intake, potassium intake, obesity, the usual lifestyle factors is causative factors. But is this really only, isn't this only symptoms rather than the cause of hypertension? And that is what we need to know. So we want to know why is there a loss of blood pressure control despite improved medical treatment? Um, it doesn't make sense. Um, so um, the five common barriers to hypertension control was mentioned uh, just recently. And that is that there's poor or inconsistent measurement techniques. Um, it's masked. 
So blood pressure is normal in office and outside when you go out of the doctor's office, it is high. So, um, so what is actually lacking is that these evidence-based treatment protocols are lacking. And you can, if we review papers, we, re, we really see this, that the, the protocols is not up to standard in many papers. And that is why so many of them are rejected. So um, another factor, the fourth factor, is that there's clinical inertia. That means there's not enough movement from the clinical care team to intensify treatment during an office visit. And um, there's poor participant or patient participation in managing their own behaviors. And I will call this the patient inertia. There's not enough movement from the patient to take responsibility for his own health. So if we look once again at these factors, mental health is not one of the causes. If you, if you look at the, the risk factors uh, that societies or, um, and the guidelines for cardiology associations say, stress is at the bottom of the causative factors. And then normally they, um, they reflect on uh, questionnaires and so on, which is the usual thing to use. But we are really experiencing a, a lot of problems with the questionnaires. So what the World Health Organization has said is that mental health is a state of well-being where you realize your own abilities and how you can cope with life stresses. And if that is in balance, you can work productively and make a contribution to the community. And interesting enough, in a, 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 a study for last year from Denmark where 7 million people were included, they found that life expectancy in males and females with poor mental health was 11 and 8 years shorter, respectively, compared with the general population. And that is actually an um, uh, astonishing finding. So for three decades, we aim to understand hypertension and mental health. We did several observational studies um, in um, how is it on the rural in farm work areas? How is it in urban dwelling areas? What's, what is the difference between these and where is more stress um, uh, prevalence and so on? So that is what we've done. So we set a hypothesis or a question to answer this. Will poor mental health relate to hypertension and stroke risk? Um, so that was our main question and uh, we got some interesting findings I will show you. And But first, before we get to the findings, um, just a small intro on how the brain control blood pressure and emotion, because the brain is our main control system. And if you look at the slide, we know that the brain is our power station. It controls everything in the body. So, um, and especially the target organs, then the heart, the kidneys and the blood vessels. And it does that by secreting neurohormones. And neurohormones is, or stress hormones is cortisol or no adrenaline. And uh, adrenaline is uh, from the uh, in the adrenal medulla on the kidneys. But that is the stress hormones. And there's several other stress hormones. But we will only um, uh, vaguely look at these. And I will just uh, define them as stress hormones. And another thing is just via blood pressure. Because if there's something wrong, Blood pressure is actually an active compensatory factor to tell us that there's something wrong because blood pressure carries oxygen and glucose to the target organs. So it will try to compromise and if there's something wrong to increase uh, regeneration or whatever the problem is, and then it will increase and most probably give you hypertension if it's a chronic state. So if I say there's a, um, a short circuit, this whole cycle is disrupted because there's something wrong in one of the organs. What will happen? We have to remember that the brain has no oxygen or glucose storage, only for uh, glucose for two minutes, glycogen that's broken down and so on. But, and the only thing that can help you is to balance the, the, the oxygen and the glucose in the brain via a cycle, a negative feedback cycle. So if the balance between heart, kidney and blood vessels and the brain is not in balance, 
you will surely get that the, the drive from the brain will be higher to repair what is happening in the kidney and the heart. And the demands for oxygen and glucose will increase. When there's chronic stress, what will happen is, is that the brain starts to suffer and it will decrease or increase the sensitivity or activity in any of these organs to try to find balance and then to prevent pathology. So, and this is not a new thing. Claude Bernard has said this in the previous uh, dec um, a century. So, um, and it's still the same. The physiology stays the same. We have to know that uh, a very important remark that one of the, the previous stress uh, experts on CJ has said, he said, it's not stress that kills us, but it's your reaction or coping with stress. And I refer, refer to the three big P's, personality, previous experiences, and perception of stress, which is a challenge or a threat, and that will uh, actually uh, influence how we uh, react and our behavioral responses to the challenge or the threat. If we look at um, uh, this, the defense response, how we cope with stress, we are normally aware of our senses, awareness of the environment and the input in the brain and how our brain will react to that. So it's so emotional response, cognitive evaluation, it sends input back and integrate these emotions and then it will activate heart rate and also stress hormone release. So in the end, the defense response will actually um, uh, increase this whole cycle of, of uh, defense, keep you alert, trying to solve uh, or, um, the solution to a problem. And um, if that is a chronic state, it can be um, uh, devastating to your health as well. So um, what the findings that we have shown that uh, we have done, we started quite primitively, but uh, uh, I actually am proud we, our team has gotten us uh, in the late stages um, at the university at this stage from Northwest. Um, uh, we have a lovely um, uh, clinic there where we can do our um, um, data uh, and clinical trials and so on. And that is uh, something that helped us a lot. So we have looked at 10,000 South Africans where we compared the rural, living versus urban living um, uh, participants. And um, if you look at these environmental influences or psychosocial stress, um, this is where we started. And we actually were quite busy in four of these uh, provinces. And um, I must tell you, these data from, from this slide was the first stress presentation globally in the USA and Maryland. And um, this participant is doing the hand grip test, that is an acute stressor, because if you're exposed to an acute stressor, this is, um, it has been showed that it's also similar to out, out of uh, lab um, and everyday life stress, you react the same because your perception, your personality and previous experiences all makes the, the uh, defines you as a person. And it, it's strange that it, it will not, necessarily change. We have shown and also studies from Norway have showed that how you react to stress stays the same. So here is a hand grip test um, and we will uh, recording the, the blood pressure. He has his, um, his hand, is keeping the hand grip, but his other arm is connected to a blood pressure apparatus. And here is a lady, which is a perfect picture of how in Venda they were making porridge, um, uh, feeding the baby, working in the lands and uh, s looking at the houses and so on. So they're very versatile and resilient, the, the ladies there. And also the, the black Tetswanas that we've been working with, they are also very resilient. So this is the acute stress hand grip test. And then the next slide is where one of my other colleagues, he was um, uh, exposing another participant to a hand in ice test also for one minute and also to measure then the blood pressure. Here is the, the, the tube for the high blood pressure measurement. And also another study that um, the colleagues have done is to simulate um, a flight 
and see how pilots cope with the flight where they measured the muscles in the face and also their reactions to um, uh, any strange things that, have, that can happen in a flight. So that was a lot of functions and tests that have been done, um, but they were all observational. They were not followed up to see if the, uh, what happened over time. So the first prospective cohort that was followed for three years um, was actually then um, yeah, at, um, in, uh, done in Africa, and that was to assess chronic stress in the brain-heart axis over three years. And we have done then the, the 24-hour blood pressure apparatus, and we determined drive from the brain. Another thing was to assess the retina as part of the, um, the brain and how it activates certain responses. So what did we find? We found that um, once off blood pressure measurements, there was actually an astonishing finding is that the blood pressure increased from 1998 to 2008 in the men, um, 10, more or less 10 millimeter mercury when the heart contracted your systolic function. The diastolic function was about eight millimeter mercury high between the two years. And it was in this, um, the same uh, socioeconomic status group men. And you could see that um, this, the influences from the environment was much lower on, uh, larger on these um, uh, men than um, in 1998. And in the women, the, the versatility and the, um, the resiliency um, was quite clear. The blood pressure was really normal. No, uh, and the hypertension was there. So there was a few that reached hypertension status, but it was quite good. So then in this study, we looked at the, the 24 hour blood pressure. And that is, I want to spend a few seconds on this because it's really important. The previous blood pressure was a once off meeting. So um, with this um, uh, uh, blood pressure 24 hours, there's 42 measurements that's taken over the day and over the night. And you can see how high these blood pressure measurements is because this is the stolic contractility of the heart and this is the relaxation of the heart. But these bars should be between this line and this horizontal line. And you can see it's clearly not the case. And then blood pressure in the night from 12 o'clock to 11, 12 o'clock should dip when you get to rest and where you should regenerate. So there, is, uh, there should be a dip. If it's a non-dip situation and your blood pressure stays the same, it has implications for the treatment that you're undergoing. So the doctor will give you um, a blood pressure medication during the day. Um, if it's only high in the day, which is a, has a short uh, lifetime or is actively working. But if the blood pressure is um, high over the whole 24 hour period, he should give you medication that will work on the kidney that, that has a longer control of blood flow and blood pressure. So that will be then like the diuretics and the ACE inhibitors and things like that, that people are taking. So what did you find at the three year follow up? We could see that uh, now you have to remember to consider um, the blood pressure hypertension level as 130 and 80. Um, because I can't, it considers the night blood pressure that falls um, uh, quite a lot. Uh, it should fall 10%, but um, now the, the hypertension level is 130, 80. And you can see there was no change in the blood pressure status. So that was actually, um, uh, we referred more of them. Hypertension was slightly higher um, and diabetes was also higher. When we look at the, the stress from other um, uh, colleagues overseas, um, Tabako is a Harvard uh, graduate, and he said, um, and also working at that center, that if you activate, like the stress response that I showed you earlier, the amygdala, which is actually called the window of our soul, to evaluate any input from the environment is activated. And when it's activated, the defense response is activated in an immediate higher drive from the brain will start 
and you will get an inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response is in the bone marrow and also plaque in the, um, the main blood vessels, but also in the smaller vessels. So stress is linked to inflammation. They've showed it with um, PCT scans and uh, PT scans and also with M functional M MRIs and so on. So and a very interesting thing that we also asked our people because um, we wanted to know uh, lifestyle changes. Did you change that? Or what was your input? Did you really try to go out of your way to improve your health? And 11% uh, said they tried to stop smoking, but in, actually uh, there was a two, a two millimeter, uh, nanogram per milliliter increase in the levels in the blood. So um, it was not actually truthful. Um, they said that they started to consider taking less alcohol. And that was an uh, interesting finding because uh, uh, in the blood, the liver enzymes, GGT, gamma liver um, glutamyl transferase was actually lower. So this was truthful and this was a very interesting finding, but still the levels were quite high, but in, they tried, so good for them. And then the diet, they said they changed it, but they got fatter. There was an increase of, four centimeter in waist circumference of central obesity. And exercise, yes, we changed our exercises. We did a lot more active and so on, but it was not the case. They were more sedentary, 33% were sedentary um, at the follow-up. So you could see it's not really truthful to go according to questionnaires. What coping event was very hard for them? And, um, what was outstanding was actually uh, job achievement was more or less the same. It stayed the same to show you that personality and how you cope with stress are more or less always the same. But this outstanding figure, interpersonal conflict, shows you that your social relationships are so important and that it's very hard um, to interact, because it's not the job that gives you the stress, it's the people that you interact with, mostly that, that's making it unpleasant. And that is a um, very difficult thing to do. So if I have to take the initial findings together, we can see if you have to defend yourself chronically the whole time, you will get that these higher demands, metabolic, that is the oxygen and the glucose, the stress hormone responses will enter the, 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 the profile. And then you will see that it's not sufficient because it's chronic stress and it's not going away. So what will take it away? And that is something that you on your own can really take responsibility for and decide what can I do to change? Um, to lessen this whole uh, cycle or make it less detrimental. So if the heart suffers from oxygen, it will increase the blood pressure immediately. So what is the reason for the high blood pressure? You can see these factors may play a role. And then there's an imbalance. We call balance homeostasis, and there's an imbalance. And in the end, we could see that there's chronic defensiveness, there's a sort of a biological depression. Um, these hormones are depleted. There's a, um, a lack of oxygen. And that is all biological factors. And there's inflammation. And then we get that the stress hormones are changing and they are depleted. And um, hypertension prevalence increase. And there's also ischemia or oxygen deficit in the heart. And that's a heart disease. What about depression? And that was interesting because uh, the depression questionnaire could not in any way be related to any of these biological factors. And that was quite amazing. We, in a th a three or four um, papers that we've um, tried to take it from different angles, we could not show that it was correlated with the stress hormones, um, which is uh, uh, really accentuate the need to get a measure for stress a biological markers to get a composite uh, a picture of which factors will indicate chronic stress and not just a self-reported questionnaire. Unfortunately with depression, um, 
is that there was not interviews with this uh, patients. So, um, and normally that is actually requested. If you take a questionnaire uh, regarding stress, there should be support by that or from that. So self-report, people can complain and say they cope well with stress, but they're not feeling well. And potential masking occurs. And actually there's a depletion of resources. So it's, it's a sort of a mass control and we are master manipulators of this. We say, tell everybody, oh no, it's got, everything is fine and everything is going quite dandy here. And in the end, it's not really the case. Uh, you just have to ask two or three times, are you sure you're really good? Um, and you will get to the bottom of it. But in any case, so what will be the next challenge? And that is what we addressed um, the last three years. We say that um, the eye, which expands from the brain, will show us what is going on because um, the retinal vessels, the retina, which has a lot of cells, as light sensitive cells, will tell us what is going on. And I'm very grateful, one, uh, want to um, accentuate this, that the Heart and Stroke Foundation of South Africa, they uh, awarded us with um, some funds and that supported us to assess the brain, retina, heart axis, the whole scenario of biological markers to look at, these, um, it, at this axis. So what was our aim? We wanted to support the medical community to um, validate a screening test to assess chronic stress risk for preventive measurements where no self-reported questionnaires were used. And we were fortunate last year, July, we actually filed a patent, but it's still under examination. And we really hope that that can be successful. In the meantime, we are now giving you some of the information and the results what we, where, we, where we developed the screening tool and we validated and bioengineered models. And we applied this um, uh, screening tool. And then we, uh, we will look at, at the blood retina or brain retina heart axis. What is important to know is that um, the, 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 the eye has similar vessels than the brain. It extends from there. So, and the heart, same. It goes to the retina. So these factors are all linked to one another. And the eye cup tells us about the retina. So here, once again, in an embryo of one centimeter, we can see the retina as this dark spot. It's actually 37 days after conception. And um, it's, it's so small, but still you can see the movement there. And this is the area that we look at in the eye. And that is the light sensitive area of the retina. Th this is the picture that we looked at and which we assessed and um, when we uh, throw a drop in the eye, we can see that the, the light part of the eye, which, you, which is for visual equity, we ask the patient to focus on that. And we get the middle of the eye where the blood vessels and the nerves come out or enter the eye. And we can measure the diameters of the, the um, arteries and also then of the veins. This carries oxygen and glucose, and then this the waste, sub, waste substances. And uh, once again, this is then the area, the retina, which I will elaborate a little bit. And this is how that layer looks like. A lot of neurons or nerve cells, a lot of blood vessels. And if I enlarge this, you can see this is the blood vessel and it has tight uh, uh, cells uh, surrounding it with very tiny gaps in between and it's surrounded by support cells. Um, and when there's a lot of stress, like diabetes, which is a stressful condition, and stress per se, chronic stress, there's higher inflammation. And that may induce, if, the, um, if there's uh, diabetes, this blood vessel will um, widen. And then the joints or the gaps will open up a little bit and there will be leakage. And so the inflammation will increase. And it can also be that the, the support cells, these support cells can detach 
from um, the blood vessel. And that is breaching of this very tight, tight um, brain barrier, retinal barrier. And you don't want that to be um, uh, uh, breached or broken because it causes loss of vision and blindness. You don't want that and op uh, um, damage to the optic nerve. You don't want that because this is where the optic nerve is. So um, uh, it's very important to realize that stress is very harmful to the retina. And here actually we, we uh, look again at the eye. This is the previous slide where we did the diameters. And this is where we actually induced acute, acute stress as well. And the acute stress, um, Strangely enough, whether we applied a hand grip or um, the flicker light to the eye or actually a cold pressure test or a color word conflict chart test, the, the, the responses stayed the same. If they are chronic stress, um, the responses will be the same. It will be accentuated, uh, attenuated. So a chronic stress changes the stress hormone profile and it will not respond optimal like it should. So we, we applied the tool, we uh, published five, uh, three papers so long, and the last paper is in progress, and that will be um, the last one from my side, mine and my husband's side. So um, we showed the ischemia, the lo loss of oxygen, the inflammation. We showed that the um, acute stress uh, affected the responses and there was a non-adaptation to the stress and we also showed that what we found in the eye was similar uh, in, in uh, uh, the, what we found in the eye of the chronic stress patients was similar to what was found in uh, Alzheimer's patients and that was actually um, uh, not nice to know that but it shows you that there's a link between the neurodegenerative diseases and chronic stress. So once again, what did we find? And this is actually amazing information. We found that the chronic stress participations, participants had high hypertension versus the non or low stress participants, 73%. And you can also see the inflammation, the chronic inflammation that was there. And it was spot on to predict diabetes status. It was 12% in the chronic stress and no percent in the low or non-stress participants. There was a glaucoma risk, there was a loss of uh, retinal arteries, and there was a non-adaptation to stress. So once again, um, uh, when you look at the findings that we got, it was, uh, there was a cognitive decline, there was brain injury, there was central obesity in the purple bars, uh, which is the stress people, there was clotting, which is a risk factor for stroke, there was higher insulin resistance or sensitivity. There was DNA damage. There was nerve cell damage. There was inflammation. And taken together, this is all the findings that we showed in these last three papers. And it was all highly significant different from the low or non-stressed. So these findings then once again shows you now, we could tell now that there was a depletion in stress hormones. The, the metabolic demands increased. The changes in the retinal blood vessel diameters was towards pathology. There was delayed recovery responses due to the changes in the stress hormones. And that implies that there may be leakage in the, in the blood retinal barrier. Um, so it's, it's time to take action. I think so. So this chronic and stress risk a tool that we applied showed that there's an oxygen deficit in the brain and there's a stroke um, risk for that uh, uh, patients. And also the non-adaptation uh, to stress shows that the resilience is not there because the stress hormones are not optimally working or functioning. And we get then uh, that there may be a breaching in, the, in that blood uh, vessel and brain tissue which is a leakage and can induce brain injury. So what is the balance that we have to get to improve our resiliency? That is, I will put a, I divided a, a movie into a few slides. And I want to ask you, are you too busy 
for healthy brain heart function. And all of these slides have been based on solid um, evidence over time. Um, so let's look at our first letter and that is balance. Uh, U is R U or you are what you eat, social, and the why your boundaries and beliefs busy. Are you too busy for brain heart function? So let's look at a balance. You have to find balance between work and play to be healthy. You can't just work and you can't just play. You are what you eat. If you are a healthy person, you don't have diabetes or hypertension. Normally what you must uh, eat is uh, protein portions three times a day, your fat portions three times a day, and then also carbohydrates three times a day. And that's more or less the portions that you should take. But in any case, um, uh, uh, remind, be reminded that it can make change due to the diseases that can be uh, underlying. So, and what about social factors? Your family, your friends, your colleagues, you have to maintain relationships with them. But once you feel that there is, um, uh, that they don't take your interest at heart, you have to revise how you will go further on or um, distract yourself a little bit to, to, to prevent any conflict. Your boundaries and beliefs. How, when do you say yes? How do you say no? What is your compass? Your hope, positivity. All these things may influence how you balance your life. What is the clinical implications? Connect for um, chronic defensiveness will drain your biological and psychological resources and induce pathology. It's mass control. Biological depression precedes psychological depression. Because, so when you get to the doctor with this, there's a biological depression a long time before that. What is your take home message? Understand your brain and how it affects your mental health. The need to take responsibility for your own health will make you resilient and minimize the risk for chronic stress, related hypertension, diabetes, and stroke. And Frankel had this uh, very uh, important saying that if we are aware of our own stress symptoms and sources, we must also know that we do have a choice in what to do with that which we find stressful. And this is my team, um, a lot of international players that we contacted earlier on, and mostly clinicians are, uh, are involved, and then also my, my team at uh, the Hypertension Africa Research Team, that uh, it will not have been possible to get here without the support and loyalty to, to support what we found and how we could describe it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Milan, for that very insightful presentation and um, sharing with us the very interesting findings in your papers, and also for highlighting the fact that chronic stress links poor mental health, hypertension, and stroke risk. With that now, we come to the end of the presentation, and we have about 10 minutes left for questions and answers. So please, if anyone has a question, either raise your hand or you can put your question into the chat and Prof Milan will be happy to answer any questions. I don't see anything so far in the chat room. Does anyone have a question for Prof? Hey. Yes. I'm not sure if uh, no questions is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no questions from anybody means oh. everybody 
everything Hello. was clear. Can you hear me now, Haley? I can hear you. Oh, yes, we can hear you. It's Prof Naidu, Pamela. Lovely to oh. uh, speak with you again. How are you? No, fine. Thanks, Pamela. Nice to hear from you again. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for such an insightful uh, presentation. And of course, we're very excited because, you know, we were able to fund such interesting research. Um, I just, you know, being a, a sort of a mental health uh, specialist myself at some level, besides public health, I just wondered um, in terms of, you know, because what you basically talked about is to look at an individual from a biological, psychological and a social perspective. But we don't find that our healthcare system is like amenable to that. Mm. Do you have any suggestions uh, around or recommendations where we can, you know, make uh, the, the psychological or the, bio, you know, the biopsychosocial factors more important in the treatment process? Um, Pamela, I don't think that, uh, uh, well, uh, like I said, if you want to see how where mental health stands, which has a lot of uh, sub, um, uh, uh, like stress and depression and anxiety, there's so many factors, schizophrenia, there's so many factors um, which is uh, under the, the, the flag of um, uh, mental health. But um, if you want to know if someone has a lot of stress or depression or so, uh, I think it will be a good thing um, to can say that I can quickly do the stress test, which is really a very fast thing to do and easy to use because we developed a mobile application. And um, it's actually three biological markers and a blood pressure which will tell you this person is, has a high risk for uh, chronic stress. And we tested that over time and it was independent of age, race or gender. So, and that actually um, is in uh, concurring with what we know that stress affects everybody. It doesn't matter if you're old or young uh, or you are yellow, black, pink or whatever color you are. And if you are male or female, um, uh, it, it affects everyone. So if you have this diagnosis or you have done the screen test, then the doctor can say, but listen, you are really having chronic stress, but he doesn't know what the person, what is happening in the person's life. If he lost his wife or, his, um, or their husband, um, we know that will take time. It's a, a, it's, it's a process that has to pass. But if it's chronic stress, like interpersonal conflict at your work, what will you do? Um, and that patient has to tell the doctor that, that, that he is struggling to cope with that. And if he doesn't do it, he will have to take responsibility to solve this problem. And the healthcare system, unfortunately, has become too fast. Because if you go to a GP, he has 10 or 15 minutes for you. So if he can do a quick blood test, and you get the results within the day or so, and you have to go and see him. Obviously, he tells you to get this test beforehand, go to the lab and get the blood test, and it can tell you you have chronic stress. He will be, I think he will be able to uh, improve his diagnosis because it's a valid marker of risk. And with the, the, the uh, evidence that's come out, um, he will immediately see, but he has to look out for these other related risk markers as well. Um, and I think this is the process that we can help it with because uh, the biological signs, um, as we showed it from the brain, uh, which controls everything, um, and the input from the senses, it's not psychologically, it's always colored with emotion, but the senses, makes a difference and then the thoughts about it can evoke the same sense pathway and so it's first a biological neuroscience pathway and immediately colored with emotions and then interpreted further way in the defense response but if you have a diagnosis and you take it from there i think it will help the system quite a lot i really think so Yes, no, thank you so much, Leonie, because, you know, I think it also speaks to the psychoneuroimmunology, you know, we've been talking about this theoretical framework for a long time, but very insightful, thank you so much, I love the idea of the, 
the biological marker. I think that would be a real game changer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Haley. I see there's a, there's a question. So if you want to just maybe move on to the question in the chat box, thanks. Yes, thanks, Prof. Um, first, I see that Donovan Roy has raised his hand. Donovan, have you got a question for Prof? Yes, I have a question. I'd just like to confirm that I can be heard. Okay. Yes, you can, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation, Prof. I was more specifically interested in the method, methodology used in the stratification of the stressed and the no stress groups. Um, and I do understand that certain stressor marker of tests were used to quantify this. However, um, what constitutes someone to have no stress? Because clearly living in the South African context, um, stress is quite present in all of our lives and now in 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 the study how yes how what constitutes someone to have no stress or be in a no stress group within the uh, study that we performed that's a very good question donovan um, yes and i think prof especially in these times with the pandemic you know, um, uh, our uh, German collaborator who is working on cortisol, Professor Clemens Kirschbaum, he told me, what is going on in South Africa? Look where the cortisol levels are. So he acknowledged that our cohort showed a lot of stress. And it was uh, our cohort consists of teachers in urban teachers, urban dwelling teachers, uh, here in the Northwest area, in the Kenneth Kahunda district. And they all had similar socioeconomic status, so it was not a psychosocial thing. Um, but they had the same, they had the same salaries, they had education, they had uh, access to um, medical funds. So there was not a, other problems that was involved here. And um, what happens is that you can't say if somebody hasn't got any stress. Everyone has stress, but the way that you cope with it may be the may be make the difference. And some people just cope better. There's a lot of um, science that went into our coping um, research, and that's actually another topic. I think you must contact me, and we can have a discussion on our own because <laughs> the, the the coping responses. If you have a defense, uh, if you're trying actively to solve your problems in the in where you have no really stress and you are supported and everything is fine. And there's acculturation to an urban dwelling area where you are not within your group and feel threatened or so, it increases your stress. And immediately you react differently to that because it's a social, less social support that you are experiencing. And that makes you feel safe. And uh, I think I speak for everyone that we don't feel safe in South Africa anymore, uh, which is a hard thing. Um, and now with the pandemic, I, I uh, foresee that we will have a sort of a post-traumatic stress um, phase after this pandemic, um, which will increase our stress. But I think we have to trust and uh, feel that um, we are cared for and we will be okay. And I told my husband, uh, you know, the, the, um, I know many people are leaving the country, but you have to ask yourself, it's not always better on the other side. I was there, it was not always better. So um, I think trust in yourself, try to cope better, but see what you can do to change your situation. Um, isolate yourself from the people that's not good for you, that doesn't care about you that you don't have to work so closely together with them or your friends that is not honest with you. Uh, this is, there's certain things that you can change. It's just how, how hard up are you to change that? Are you, are you willing to change that? Thank you, Prof. I yeah, think, thank, you, Prof. <laughs> thank you very much. We've got a few other questions. So we've, I see our time is running out, but Prof, if you could just take one or two more questions. Um, we've got one question and that is, please, when the healthcare professional does an eye pressure test, does this show or indicate blood leakage in the retina? And I was also wondering 
about this question. If you can detect a high blood pressure in the eye. Yes, well, it, when the healthcare professional does an eye pressure test, does it indicate blood leakage in the retina? No, you will not see that. You will not really see that. But there are factors, like I said, a chronic inflammation that will, yes. uh, and the widening of the veins in the retina that will open the, the tight gaps, uh, the junctions there between the cells that surround the, the small uh, capillaries or the small blood vessels. And then you can uh, expect that there will be a leakage, but there will be loss of function. And, and the doctor will be able, we are working closely with a, a eye specialist and a ophthalmologist, and um, uh, they know how to detect that. But uh, taking your eye pressure quite often, two times a year, maybe go to the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, optometrist and they uh, look at your eye pressure because they take your, if you consider your diastolic blood pressure, your lowest blood pressure, and you extract your eye pressure from that, it will tell you um, if there's enough oxygen or perfusion into the vessels in the eye. So if that level, say your diastolic blood pressure is 80 and your eye pressure is um, uh, um, say 20, then there's a, it's 30 millimeter mercury difference. Is, it, is that the, the fact? 50, now, now I'm sounding very stupid. 80 minus 50, um, uh, minus 30 and it's 50, the answer. So if it's lower than 50 millimeter mercury, there's not enough oxygen or perfusion to the eye. And then it tells you, but um, it's not correct. But normally it's not that exact figures, but the pr pressure in the eye should not be too low. So if the doctors is too strict and very uh, 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 hands-on with the blood pressure measurements, he can lower your blood pressure too low, uh, to, to a low level. And that's also not that good. So there has to be a balance yes. between these things, but um, uh, I can send you uh, uh, the, the formula if you want, um, but uh, you should look at your eye pressure. Your eyes tells everything, really. Uh, uh, those, so those guys that look in your eyes and said you are emotionally depressed, we could see that there's a loss of, of uh, blood vessels in the eye just by looking at the eye. You can see if someone has hypertension, it looks like a, uh, the blood vessels are strongly um, uh, coiled and so on. You can see it if there's high blood pressure. So there's a lot of things that you can detect in the eye. It's true. Thank you, Prof. If we could take one last question um, from Deerveld. He says, do you think from a metabolic standpoint, we can find a precursor for cortisol that can be investigated in depressed patients? Or are there already some of these precursors that were already discovered in your SAP study that you were the principal investigator of? I haven't seen something thus far in my literature search for my postgraduate report. He says he's uh, hope his question is clear. Uh, the question's not that clear. Uh, cortisol is a terrible factor. <laughs> it's, a stress, it's a stress hormone, but I think due to its uh, versatility, um, it has such a lot of functions metabolically and in, on immune level and so on. But with the one paper uh, we published recently, we saw that it's actually the HPA axis which controls the release of cortisol in the end that was not functioning properly because of depletion of the hormones. So what happened is that um, it should, because it has a vasoconstrictor function on the blood vessels. And if that is not happening, um, there's a delay in the response to baseline recovery. So the, 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 the tone in the vessel is not there. And if that is not there, it's a bad, bad sign. So that can, have a sort of a retrograde effect on the blood vessels in the barrier, uh, which can induce actually this non-adaptation. The HPA axis is not actually reacting. 
uh, and it's cortisol that that happened to have an effect like that there was actually a, a attenuation of cortisol the levels was down 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 so uh, and we know that we have to test cortisol uh, early in the morning before nine o'clock for because to the circadian rhythm but um, when the cortisol levels are low, you can test it. There's many uh, guys that also found this. Uh, uh, right through the day, the levels will be low. And if the, the cause is uh, chronic stress, it will stay that way. Um, and that can influence the tone of the blood vessels, which is a bad thing. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, Devilt. Yes, I see Diabel said thank you, Prof, in the chat. Okay. I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, so we know that blood pressure is measured with one figure over another, which is systolic and diastolic pressure. Can you clarify between the two which one is more dangerous than the other? <laughs> As sometimes you'll find a systolic being abnormal and the diastolic being normal. You're putting me in a tight spot now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to lean towards diastolic blood pressure. Okay. Because the brain, if diastolic blood pressure, um, which actually has a lot of influence on the tone in the small blood vessels in your brain, um, I normally uh, tend to think that has the, the, the biggest factor. But I must tell you, a systolic blood pressure, when you're older, the systolic blood pressure will increase due to the loss of elasticity and so on. But the, the loading effect of diastolic blood pressure in the brain, it's very hard. You have to remember that the blood pressure that goes through your arm, that same blood pressure goes to that small, small capillaries and blood vessels in your eye. So it's a tremendous thing. And that is why stroke can happen so easily if your blood pressure is not controlled. And that is why yes. it's so important to control it. But the loading effect and the leakage later on in, uh, in the barrier, that, that is a thing that we should think about, you know? Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Prof Milan for, again, for the very insightful presentation. And I think um, two important take home messages came across for me. And that was firstly, that understanding your brain and how mental health is affected may improve your understanding of how you cope with stress. And also secondly, it will help you to take responsibility for your own health. And then just to end off, um, the foundation will continue its efforts to advocate for a healthy environment and create public awareness around mental health as a major risk factor for hypertension as Prof has highlighted for us today. Um, also to let you know that we have a health chat line and our professional team is on hand to assist you by providing free information and support on heart health. So to speak to one of our, our professionals, call our national office and book a slot between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. That's Monday to Friday. And our head office number is 021-422. 1586. We can put that information up um, so that everyone has it. And please do keep in touch and give us a call and also look out on our social media platforms for our next Mended Hearts and Stroke meeting. So thank you everyone for your attendance and thank you Prof. And um, I hope everyone has, in, has a safe and um, peaceful evening tonight.